Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mrs. Choma Anokuro. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 16th inaugural lecture of the Pan Atlantic University. Today's lecture will be delivered by Professor Kemi Oguyemi, and it is titled Apples, Barrels, and Workplace Flourishing Striving for Ethical Identity. In a couple of minutes, the faculty procession will commence, followed by the principal members of the university. Kindly sit back, relax, and enjoy the lecture. Thank you, and once again, you are welcome to PA. Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please may we all rise as the faculty procession is about to commence. The faculty members are followed immediately by the principal officers of Pan Atlantic University. The procession is led by the flag bearer. Kindly remain standing as they proceed to their seats, please. Mrs. Nkiru Gachuku, who is acting on behalf of the registrar to the podium. Thank you. The National Anthem.
bless the anthem. The Vice Chancellor, the trustees of the Pan Atlantic University Foundation, members of the Governing Council, principal officers of the university, members of the University Management Council, members of Senate, deans of schools, directors of centers and units faculty members, staff, students, and alumni of Pan Atlantic University. Our guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Enasa Ikonedo, I welcome you to this momentous occasion of the 16th inaugural lecture of Pan Atlantic University. Inaugural lectures provide a platform for new professors to share their contributions to scholarship, current research, and future research plans with the university community and the public. Today, we gather to celebrate the ascension of a faculty member to the exalted rank of professor. Professor Kemi Oguyemi, Professor of Business Ethics at Lagos Business School, Pan Atlantic University, will shortly deliver the 16th inaugural lecture of the university. The lecture titled, Apples, Barrels, and Workplace Flourishing, Striving for Ethical Identity, will undoubtedly inspire, challenge, and elevate our understanding of ethics. Please permit me to introduce the people on stage from my extreme right. Dr. Darlington Aolo, Dean, School of Science and Technology. <laughs> Dr. Adora Onaga, Director, Institute of Humanity. <laughs> Professor Chris Obweche, Dean, Lagos Business School. Next to him is our dear Vice Chancellor, Professor Enase Okonedo. We have the inaugural lecturer, Professor Kemi Ogunyemi, and Dr. Oluwa Shola Oni, Dean, School of Management and Social Sciences. Dr. Ikechuku Obiaya, Dean, School of Media and Communication. My name is Nkiru Okachuku, acting on behalf of the Registrar of Pan Atlantic University. I now invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Enase Okonedo, to formally introduce the lecturer. Please let us welcome Professor Okonedo with a round of applause. Oluwa Kemi Abiola Ogunyemi, Professor of Business Ethics at Lagos Business School, Pan-Atlantic University, was born in Ife, Oshun State, 
to Chief Toye Ogunyemi and Professor Shola Ogunyemi. She attended three primary schools, Alafia Nazarian Primary School, Abadina Primary School, and University of Ibadan Staff School. After this, she went on to the Federal Government Girls College, Oyo. In the first years of secondary school, she started publishing newspaper articles, published a magazine, first edition in JS1 and the second in JS2. <laughs> together with two classmates, and wrote a full-length novel together with a classmate. When she finished secondary school, Kemi was admitted into University of Ibadan to study veterinary medicine. After an exciting and rewarding first year science program, she transferred into the second year of the law program, at the end of which she was in the first batch of her set to be admitted to the Nigerian Law School. From there, she graduated with a 2-1 degree and the Debo Akonde Best Performance Prize in Criminal Procedure in the bar final examination. <laughs> After being called to the bar, Kemi spent her National Youth Service Corps year working in the projects of Women's Board, Educational Corporation Society, an NGO with which she had already been working whilst at the university. She stayed on with Women's Board after the year as coordinator, team lead, and center director in various development projects with secondary and tertiary students. In this capacity, she traveled extensively to oversee projects in various Nigerian towns, Enugu, Benin City, Ogun, and Oyo, and to guide and mentor other project leads. Following 10 years of development work with Women's Board, Kemi changed jobs, applying for and securing a job at Lagos Business School, Pan-Atlantic University, to manage the school's senior management program. While there, she enrolled first in the school's MBA program, and then in University of Strathclyde's LLM, IT, and Telecommunications Law. Towards the end of both programs, she changed role to become the MBA director for both the full-time and executive MBA programs. She enjoyed every moment, but then she discovered a love for teaching. And so she enrolled in the school's PhD program and transited into a faculty role. Since then, apart from regular classroom teaching, she has also been involved in various bespoke training programs and speaking engagements within and outside the country, including on the School of Politics, Policy and Governance, Certificates in Public Leadership Program, at the monthly forum of the Japan External Trade Organization, and at tertiary institutions in Ghana, Mexico, and Mauritius. Her PhD work was conducted under the supervision of Professor Juan Manuel Lelejido and Professor Dominic Mele of ESA Business School, and examined loyalty from employers to employees and quality of human treatment in organizations. As part of the latter work, she carried out case study research, which enabled her to develop a skill for measuring quality of human treatment in organizations and to compare this with employees' commitment to and satisfaction with their organizations. Parts of her thesis have been published in Philosophy of Management, Ogun Yemi 2014, and in the Journal of Business Ethics, Magi Ha Ogun Yemi and Grants 2022. She currently teaches business ethics, managerial anthropology, self-leadership, and sustainability management at Lagos Business School. She was for many years the director of the Christopher Colade Center for Research in Leadership and Ethics, as well as the academic director for the school senior management program. Her consulting and research interests include personal ethos, work-life ethic, social responsibility, sustainability, governance, and anti-corruption effort. She has authored numerous publications and is the editor of the three-volume resource for faculty in tertiary institutions, teaching ethics across the management curriculum and of African virtue ethics traditions for business and management. She also co-edited Managing for Responsibility, 
a source book for an alternative paradigm, ethics and accountable governance in Africa's public sector, products for the conscious consumer, developing marketing and selling ethical products, humanistic perspectives in hospitality and tourism, responsible management in Africa, responsible management of shifts in work modes, and management and leadership for a sustainable Africa. She wrote the book, Responsible Management, Understanding Human Nature, Ethics, and Sustainability. Professional and practitioner associations with which she has been affiliated over the years include the Nigerian Bar Association, the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission, the UK Women in Compliance Awards, the Academy of Management, African Academy of Management, European Business Ethics Network, Business Ethics Network of Africa, Australasian Business Ethics Network, Academy of International Business Southwest, Southwest Case Research Association, Association of Business Information Systems, UN Development Program, UNDP, UN Global Compact, UN Principles for Responsible Management Education Working Group on Anti-Corruption, International Society of Business, Economics and Ethics, the UN Office of, on Drugs and Crimes, Expert Group for the Education for Justice Initiative, the Fair Work Project, and the African Program of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House. She's She set up the Nigerian chapter of the Humanistic Management Network and was chapter lead from 2014 to 2023 and a member of the Global Board. In addition, she was the head of programmatic work on the founding committee of Principles for Responsible Management Education, Chapter Africa, and is currently the series editor for the Rutledge Taylor and Francis Principles for Responsible Management Education books. Besides this, she is a member of the editorial board of Palgrave Macmillan's Humanism in Business series, of the editorial advisory board of the South African Journal of Business Management, and of the editorial committee for the Revista Civilicia Ciencia Socialis e Humanas. She acts as a doc reviewer for the Journal of Business Ethics, the Journal of Management Development, and the African Journal of Business Ethics, amongst others, and for several conferences. She also serves on the board of Cardiac Integrated Limited, on the Call to Love Initiative Advisory Board, on the Advisory Board of the Business Ethics Network of Africa, and the Advisory Board of the Institute of Management Research of Collegium Civitas Poland. Finally, she volunteers at Lagoon School, Iroto Rural Development Center, and Lagoon Institute of Hospitality Studies, all in Nigeria, and supports various NGO projects that work with women and girls all over the country. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Abiola Kemiogunyemi. The Vice Chancellor, the Registrar, other Principal Officers of the Pan Atlantic University, the Dean Lagos Business School, other Deans and Directors, Heads of Department, Members of the Senate and Congregation, my Lord Spiritual and Temporal, Members and Friends of the Pan Atlantic University, Directors of Research Centers and Initiatives, Special Guests, Fellow Academia and Professional Colleagues, Family Members and Friends, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming to my inaugural lecture. I am truly honored. I will start by introducing myself to you and then go on to tell you what I have been up to over the years of my academic journey. 
I grew up in Ibadan and in Federal Government Girls College, Oyo, in Oyo State. I had a fun-filled childhood, despite being very introverted outside of my home. Among the most notable memories I have is that of reading a lot. My siblings and I devoured books. Our parents encouraged reading widely and not only bought books, including several sets of encyclopedia, but also gave us access to libraries in, outside at our home. I owe a lot to Abadina Media Resources Center in the University of Ibadan. For some periods of our lives, we went to the Resources Center library almost daily after school, and sometimes on Saturdays as well. I also remember a library at Oyo and the library run by the British Council for decades in Ibadan. Our parents gave us a lot of, of freedom and a sense of responsibility. You could do anything you liked within reason and with full awareness that you would have to live with the consequences. For example, each of us chose whether we wanted to go to boarding school or day school, and we all chose what we wanted to study at university. We were guided, encouraged, cajoled, supported, etc. But in the end, you made your choice, and they went with it. I am more conscious now than ever of the value of these priceless gifts. Thank you, mom and dad. <laughs> Together with a keen sense of nobility and honor, determination and commitment, you infuse humor and serenity into our growing up years. The songs and stories that we listened to accentuated this and have added vibrant hues to our lives and made our childhood unforgettable. Farming deepened our appreciation of nature and the positive results of hard work. Road trips and the encouragement to always write about them broadened our minds and developed our imagination and curiosity, as well as our writing skills and a love for seeing new places, meeting people, and embracing novel experiences. I had wonderful teachers all through primary school. Alafia Primary School, Mokola laid a great foundation, although I only remember singing and marching at assembly and staring through the gates after school. Our house was practically opposite the school, but we had to wait to be picked up since we couldn't go out of the grounds unaccompanied. In the one year primary two that I spent at Abadina, amongst other things, I learned to read and write in Yoruba, a skill that has given me a lot of pleasure over the years. While in Star School UI, the hymns at assembly spoke to me daily of honor, great exploits of heroes, and admirable character traits, traits. And the annual collection of the essays we had written during the school year spurred me on to write more. Topics such as my life history as a lost coin or my life history as a broom particularly challenged our imagination and our creative thinking. Among my teachers in secondary school, Ms. Tan, Mr. Olaleye, Mr. Ajidaun, Mrs. Aswelimen, Mr. Jao, and Mrs. Ajidaun come to mind at this moment. I am grateful to them and to the others for the formation they imparted to us. I also appreciate their allowing my unusual, my unusual combination of subjects. I was a full science student, but I continued with fine art, French, and literature up to the final secondary school certificate exams. This cost me history, economics, geography, and agricultural science. Sadly, it was impossible to do everything as I would have wanted. My dream from primary school was to study medicine. In secondary school, it changed to medicine or law. But by the time I did CHAM, it was medicine, medicine, medicine. When my jam score fell short of the cutoff mark for medicine, since I had no second choice, I processed the change of course to veterinary medicine, planning to go from first year veterinary medicine to second year medicine and surgery. However, when I saw how many people were planning the same thing, after considering that it might be more interesting to finish university earlier than later, I decided to change to second year law instead. I am ever, ever grateful to Professor Anifalaje, who listened to and accepted my argument for transferring into the Faculty of Law, and Professor Ayri, who agreed to release me from the Department of Vet Med. They usually didn't like releasing the students who did well in the first year. As you would expect, my loving parents supported me. Fast forward past law school and a period of intense and fulfilling development work with secondary and tertiary students for Women's Board Educational Cooperation Society which had started while I was in university and ended formally about June 2006, six months after I had joined Lagos Business School in January. My LBS journey has been interesting. I have learned a lot from my colleagues, from when I started in the executive education department with Solomon, Okwe, Lillian, and Henry, to my stint as the MBA director and my subsequent move to join the faculty. 
Sometimes people ask me why I chose to specialize in ethics. It was both happenstance and providence. Before it was ethics, it could have been anything else. After it was ethics, it could be nothing else. My PhD work was concluded under the supervision of Professor Juan Manuel Elegido and Professor John Menek Mele, and it examines loyalty from employers to their employees and the quality of human treatment in organizations. As part of the latter work, I carried out case study research, which enabled me to develop a scale for measuring the quality of human treatment in organizations. Part of my first thesis has been published in the philosophy of management, as the vice chancellor mentioned, and the second one has also been published in the Journal of Business Ethics. Both of them have greatly influenced my teaching and my subsequent research, which continues to lean heavily on normative perspectives around virtue ethics approaches and a humanistic lens applied to various fields and in diverse contexts. I have over the years been interested in indi individual ethical behavior and its em enablers and inhibitors from within and without the human person. From within, the spirituality of human beings allows for choice to self-determine and for practicing responsibility and integrity despite and because of nature and nurture. From without, the culture and the climate of the organization, like that of a country on a larger scale, can also facilitate or hinder ethical behavior. It is in a similar vein that bad apple, bad barrel scholars rely on the dynamics of structuration to suggest that organizations, and I believe countries as well, contribute causally to the unethical decision making of human agents within them. I believe that companies need to adopt both compliance and integrity approaches in the bid to create a place for human flourishing in a sustainable way. Using a diagrammatic expression, that you see on the slide, which shows an x-axis of compliance moving from reducing situations to enhancing controls, and a y-axis of integrity that moves from reducing rationalizations to enhancing ethical character. It becomes easy to see how organizations enable or inhibit ethical behavior. Almost every group of professionals to whom I have taught ethics have seen this, program, this diagram they usually co-create the content as a class so that they can apply the template later in life. Through teaching and research, we're all called to make the world a better place by speaking to the spirituality of our students. Since spirituality is the greatest enable, enabler of individual ethical behavior, and this is what I spoke about at the Academy of Management in 2017, in addition, in my book chapter on managerial anthropology, I try to capture in a matrix what can be expected of graduates of our university if we're able to impart both technical competence and a holistic view of the human being that facilitates ethical competence. Knowing that this is not an easy task, I have added a few resources to those already out there to help educators who might want to incorporate a holistic humanistic vision in their classrooms and foster ethical sensitivity for their learners. It was in the work of Lynn Sharpin that I first came across the compliance and integrity approaches to managing organizations for integrity. Later on, I found more academic literature using apple and barrel theories to explain unethical decision making where the organization is likened to a barrel in which the apples, the people, are kept. The idea is that if the barrel is healthy, then the apples are likely to flourish, whereas a rotten barrel would be likely to spoil the apples placed in it. And the bad apples and bad barrels are seen as antecedents of unethical decisions at work. I found that these ideas, pains, compliance, and integrity approaches, and the bad apple bad barrel concepts layered into a, the diagram that I showed earlier proved very useful for teaching ethics and it has also influenced my research interests. It gave me a wide spectrum since I could focus not only on understanding bad apples and bad barrels but also explore what makes good apples and what makes good barrels using this framework. The Y axis is the apple axis. The people in the organization are capable of growing in ethical character but a strong force against that growth and the alignment with ethical character is the tendency that we all have to rationalize, which could be fueled by lapses from either of the two axes. 
Efforts to promote ethical behavior along the y-axis fall under the integrity approach. The x-axis is the organization axis, the barrel. The barrel can be a place where people become healthier or rot in terms of ethical behavior. When a company can identify and reduce situations that lend themselves to unethical behavior and increase controls to prevent and to deal with unethical behavior, they help the people to live out their values more easily and to flourish in that workspace. Efforts to promote ethical behavior along the x-axis fall under the compliance approach. In exploring the ethical traditions guiding individual behavior in Africa, it took a lot of hard work, but it was very interesting. I had an intuition that virtue ethics traditions similar to the Aristotelian ancient Greek versions existed in Africa, and this was confirmed when I found the following virtues promoted across Africa through proverbs, proverbs folklore, idioms, riddles, song, and family and community norms and taboos. For example, in Côte d'Ivoire, discipline and truthfulness. In Egypt, creativity and self-control. In Ghana, contentment and temperance. In Kenya, generosity and justice. In Mauritius, honesty and resilience. In Nigeria, altruism, respect and wisdom. In South Africa, accountability, generosity and temperance. In Côte d'Ivoire, the folk tales have become incorporated into school curricula as well as in the teaching of citizenship. This is probably something that can be adopted in other climes in, in other countries in Africa as well. I found that both African and ancient Greek virtue traditions are oriented towards the common good, but they go through different path orientations. In contrast to the Aristotelian common good path orientation of virtue towards the individual flourishing, the common good path orientation of virtue for Africans was towards the community with an emphasis on sharing and on doing good rather than on being happy and flourishing for self. This is seen in the descriptors of who the good person is. One who practices virtues that promote human flourishing vis-a-vis -vis one who respects the sanctity of community, takes responsibility and sacrifices for others. The phronimon who in addition to his or her flourishing is also interested in the common good and the omoluabi who practices Ubuntu as a part of who he or she is. While the African orientation towards community is vital because it promotes a sense of stewardship and it also promotes a love of harmony and contentment, it also has a downside that plays a key role in the disconnect from traditional values and importance ascribed to the practice of virtue, which seems to have diminished over time as we move further and further away from our traditional roots. Human beings being spiritual, spiritual here refers to non-materiality, not to religion, by the way. Human beings being spiritual are able to make self-determining choices and to practice responsibility and integrity. In order to use that gift of being able to choose well, we all need a deeper and a right understanding of who we are. Due to this, I have always found philosophical anthropology a good foundational uh, preparation for ethical behavior. Research with the students who studied anthropology at LBS showed that this learning experience provides a foundation that gives them a strengthened humanistic perspective of respect, new consciousness of human dignity, greater appreciation for diversity, greater team spirits, and commitment to the common good. In the same study, I developed the matrix that I show you now, if it, if it appears on the screen. Okay. So in the matrix, you see that the, on one axis, we have managerial expertise moving from low to high. And on the horizontal axis, we have the complete, completeness of vision of a human being moving from partial to full. The ideal place to be would be the humanistic leader the person who is able to, uh, to perform in leading the enterprise that has the managerial exp expertise for that job and at the same time has a full vision of the human being and is therefore able to make decisions in a way that leads to ethical profitability. In any of the other, other uh, squares in the matrix, 
there will be a need for the person to learn either to improve in managerial expertise or to improve in understanding of who the human being is. It is that potential humanistic leader that is guided by a more complete vision of human nature that strives to self-develop along the integrity axis. This is emphasized in the, in the same figure of the apple and barrel. You see that if you go up, there's a, a plus sign that shows that ethical character can be strengthened, but at the same time, the person needs to reduce the tendency to rationalize, and the minus sign shows that. So that person strives to self-develop, and I use the, the verb strives deliberately here to underline that it is not a matter of perfection, it is rather a matter of a constant and consistent effort to do the right thing. The ethical person is not the one who never does anything wrong, who never makes a mistake. He's the one who strives to do the right thing until this becomes the default, and who hurries to start striving again after any misstep. The further up along the y-axis the person is, the greater sensitivity he or she will have to notice the opportunities to counter rationali rationalization and to do the right thing. Other scholars have already established that the people whose cognitive moral development is high are more likely to do the right thing, even in organizational contexts that are unethical. Yet, it sometimes takes moral courage, more than simply cognition, to consistently act rightly, especially if the environment is not conducive or is outright hostile. Moving higher on the, X, on the Y axis does demands enhancing one's moral knowledge as well as growing moral courage by acting on moral knowledge even when it is difficult. In this way, one develops good habits that forge an ethical character demonstrated by a default to ethical striving. At the same time, while rationalization can be driven by the person's own internal obstacles to ethical behavior. Many of them are predicated on external factors. For example, an employee could rationalize not doing his work just out of laziness. However, if he perceives injustice in his work environment, such as favoritism by his supervisor, a bad example by the CEO, a delay in paying his salary, this could easily tip the skills so that even if he had wanted to struggle against being lazy, he might not bother because of justifying his behavior due to the other uh, factors in the organization. This is one of the reasons why it's important for organizations to identify possible drivers of rationalization and reduce them as indicated by the minus sign in the diagram. They need to consider this when they're looking at the external enablers and inhibitors of ethical behavior that subsist in the organization. Everybody's environment affects them. With regard to ethics, especially in the context of organizations, the culture and the climate of the organization have a role to play, as well as the relationships we have with our peers, supervisors, and subordinates. In the apple barrel analogy, the x-axis that is highlighted in the current slide applies to the organization as a barrel. If the barrel is sane or infected, it will affect the apples. In the film Rocket Sing, there's a story that tells the contrast of the contrast between unhealthy and healthy barrels and what happens in, to the apples in it. Because in that film, a fresh graduate gets to work in a company which is a corrupt environment and is soon faced with the choice to leave or to join them. Eventually, he leaves and he starts a new company which strives to be ethical, even though he experiences some uh, scarring on the way. We all know either from our own personal experience or from other people's experiences at organizational levels, at national levels, the kind of pressures that people face in corrupt environments. Many times, however, ethics within organizations is not about outright corrupt practices, but about inequities between the various stakeholders management and staff, owners and management, management and the owners, company and customers, company and government, suppliers and the company, company and creditors, and many other possible permutations. A large part of my work has been focused on the ways in which organizations can do better by their workers. 
As I mentioned, my MPhil thesis was on loyalty from employers to employees. I also explored traits of employers' duties of justice, care, and benevolence towards their employees. And then I went on to look at the interplay of Mele's five organizational levels, maltreatment, indifference, justice, care, and development of human quality of treatment in four family businesses in Nigeria. From the latter, I confirmed the traits of the levels that various traits that various levels can coexist in the same organization, that organizations could reach a higher level and still fall back to a lower one, that it is not possible to master the care level without mastering the justice level, and that the knowledge of these five organizational levels and their trade school serve as a diagnostic tool for companies to move to higher levels in Malay's framework. I followed up this qualitative study with a quantitative one by developing a scale for measuring the the human quality of treatment in organizations. And I found out that the quality of this tr uh, treatment of how people are treated affects satisfaction with the organization and the kind of commitment that employees feel towards the organization. The negative traits that accompany the quality of treatment include a lack of a safe working environment at the maltreatment level ignoring emotional cues at the indifference level, unfair or delayed pay or denial of a voice at the justice level, absence of benefits not required by law at the level of care, and lack of mentoring. At the level of development, these traits will tend to cause an employee to more easily rationalize when tempted to be unethical towards the company. It's true that the fact that uh, those negative traits are not there does not automatically assure good behavior, but at least they do not inhibit it. In fact, they make the company safe for the employee physically, psychologically, mentally, spiritually, and they enable the employee to flourish. The more companies become spaces for flourishing, the more they empower their employees to be better human beings and better citizens, thereby impacting society for the better. Happily, the company is also likely to perform better. When the company and the country on a larger scale strives to ensure that its climate does not create situations that push people or organizations to rationalize unethical acts, this is positive for the culture of the whole entity. And the more people and companies strive to be ethical within the country, the, more, the, the stronger the ethical culture in that country. It is not surprising that certain characteristics of either company or country can facilitate or hinder ethical behavior. Attention to the soft issues in this regard will facilitate being able to spot the situations that can lead to unethical behavior and deal with them, while attention to the hard issues will facilitate putting controls in place to avoid or to deal with the unethical behavior when it has occurred. Companies that work along both axes of integrity and compliance, realizing that the y-axis is paramount but that both are essential, are the examples of what responsible management looks like in practice. As with individual ethical behavior, I was also able to research what responsible management used to look like traditionally in Africa. I study the ethos of business in Nigeria, in Yoruba and Igbo traditions, and also looked at women in business in the present time in both Yoruba and Igbo traditions. With two co-authors and several collaborators, I also explored the responsible management traditions of other African countries to reveal how indigenous African wisdom oriented people in business to the common good and to responsible leadership. There, we found so many practices that are rooted in philosophical concepts such as Ubuntu, Basoto Hat, Bato Pele, Omoluabi, Zonde Ramambo, Kirki, Masaza, and which yielded outcomes that defended human dignity, protected the vulnerable, and promoted flourishing for the whole community. In addition, we were able to conclude that the principles that promoted ethical work in Africa can foster sustainable human 
ecologies wherever they are adopted. And that by harnessing wisdom for Africa, for example, the Kasolewea, Kaselonkoya approach from Zambia, a more ethical world based on greater solidarity and inclusion is made more possible. We found particularly interesting the principle of NEA in Algeria, where businesses contribute to bettering the lives of their host communities, but take pride in doing this unnoticed, unlike what we normally we commonly see in the practice of uh, corporate social responsibility. NEA for the Algerians emphasizes discretion and a right intention. And the outcome of this practice, like the others, was development of the community, especially with regard to living standards. Businesses that incorporate such principles or their modern equivalents can provide that good barrel in which healthy apples can flourish. And a deep dive into the virtue ethics traditions indigenous to Africa revealed learning opportunities for modern companies. For example, traditionally wisdom and virtue are coupled. It's expected that anybody that is wise would practice virtue. And this is not always the same uh, these days because we, we tend to praise some kinds of wisdom that are not virtuous, and that's not true wisdom in the African tradition. Another learning, um, another thing we can learn from the indigenous tradition is to intensify our community orientation or to adopt relational perspectives that prioritize people. Also, we need to go back to cali recalibrating our success metrics to include the success of all stakeholders, especially the workers in the, in the organizations, and to incorporate the focus on human flourishing and community well-being into leadership styles. Many of these things are found traditionally in the way businesses were run in various countries in Africa. And because of having these principles, the activities along the compliance axis, for example, the policies and procedures that govern such enterprise will then be intentionally formulated to preserve the health of the barrel and help the apples to flourish. One of the greatest scourges affecting organizations and the country nowadays is corruption. Individuals and groups who use resources that rightly belong to everyone for their private interests in a variety of ways Companies to need to look out for situations that lend themselves to corrupt activity and establish the controls to either prevent it or to catch it and sanction those involved. For example, everyone knows that gifting and influence peddling, whether in the public or private sector, need to be watched as they are not always as innocent as they appear on the surface. There's always also the issue of extortion, which is another menace that needs to be dealt with. Now looking at how to refine both apples and barrels. Organizations that strive to be ethical in practice mean that people within those organizations are striving to be ethical. As we all know, the tone set from the top is very important in order to achieve this. From the top, an audit of the ethics practice in an organization can be carried out so that the current condition of the people with regard to integrity and of the company with regard to compliance can be ascertained. This could mean many conversations, some of them difficult and requiring courage. The result will be a clearer direction as to what needs to be done to recalibrate looking into the future. Then again, once the direction is clear, courage will be needed to implement the changes that are called for. With reference to the work that needs to be done on both axes, there were some concrete recommendations that emerged from a study on the Nigerian banking sector crisis of 2008. Uh, thus, for example, compliance measures would include investigation processes, clear policies and their enforcement, checks and balances to ensure corporate governance, while integrity measures would mean, for example, an increase in ethics training and education within the sector in order to go from reading, reading codes to the lives of the company and the lives of the individuals. Regarding the individual, embracing the full vision of being human can help the person to be more self-demanding in practicing ethics. This is more this in more and more cases includes seeing work as a calling and acknowledging spirituality in the workplace. Many scholars all over the world are working on this. 
looking at his or her work within a specific, specific function, a deep dive into ethical competence requirements of that function can also reveal ways to enhance one's ethical character. Also, enhancing the ethical character of the indi individuals will in turn improve the chances of the functional team all striving to be more ethical and therefore raise the level of striving in the whole organization. If we apply the apple barrel diagram to countries, the next figure is saying that the higher the number of companies and individuals who behave with integrity, the higher the intensity of compliance in the country, then the better each industry and the better the whole society. In that wider space, industries can evaluate themselves and see how they facilitate or, in or inhibit ethical behavior, whether they make it easier for the practitioners in that industry to rationalize their bad behavior or to be upright, and what controls they have in place to discipline those who do not do the right thing. Multinationals need to continue to complement the legal framework in which they operate with some degree of self-regulation. In some cases, they have to look to their home countries whenever the guidance there is more robust than in the host country, rather than taking advantage of the loopholes and the lack of controls to misbehave. All across the continent, we need to take stock of which practices are responsible and sustainable and which are not, and to educate the citizenry for our future. Responsible leadership is always important, but everyone has a role to play in this journey. In our experience of the pandemic, we were all exposed to the deeper reaches of the capacity for good and evil during those terrible times. And I think it opened our eyes to the need to constantly reassess and refresh, refresh our value systems and our readiness to practice virtue. With regard to teaching ethics, there has been long a debate on whether it should be a standalone course or embedded content. And the answer, the answer has been that we need both. In any case, since teachers always have the responsibility for both learning and character, the, the debate could have been ended before it started. I mentioned earlier that I've tried to contribute learning resources in order to help achieve this goal because many people who are teaching in various disciplines may not be experts in teaching ethics, even though they definitely want to make sure that they, their students acquire learning and character. There are many useful resources out there. I've mentioned them also in the, in the booklet. These resources facilitate the work of colleagues who want to bring ethical content into their classrooms. In addition to this, constantly encouraging participants in our classrooms to make constant connections between ethics and the discipline being taught on the program can be a great help. My objective as a teacher is to challenge and motivate my students to think deeper and to make good choices. And my experience of teaching multi-ethnic groups from all over Africa and teaching in other countries has made me aware of the strong similarity among the needs and interests of culturally and age-wise diverse students in this regard. Learners need to keep going beyond their comfort zones and get involved in their own learning process. And while getting an A in business ethics is not a sign of ethical striving, I have gotten a, a lot of feedback from students that being taught ethics in the classroom actually affects their lives. Students have reflected on the meaning of life, reviewed their values, crafted or touched up their personal mission statements, changed their thinking and behavior, carried out social projects, and in turn impacted their own family, friends, colleagues, organizations, customers, suppliers, society, etc. I will share some brief anecdotes about this. The first one is a student who, after attending the first few anthropology sessions, started transmitting what he was learning to his father through phone calls. And his father started changing because of those phone calls. He improved his relationship with his children, with his students, with his colleagues, and with his staff due to his new understanding of them as human beings. He stopped shouting so much, and people started liking him more. On one occasion, he had accused a student of stealing, and a month afterwards, they found the object. And it cost him a lot, but he publicly apologized to the whole um, auditorium of students, and they gave him a standing ovation. The atmosphere in his home, in his staff room, in his classroom, in his company, was totally transformed such that it was easier for the people around him to flourish. They were amazed that he could change, 
but they were all very happy and he, got more, he was more respected than before. On a learning journey to a company in Lagos, the CEO explained to the class that I went with that he employed one of our alumni because from the job interview, from the job interview he realized that these alumnus could be trusted to challenge him on ethical issues and so help him avoid making unethical decisions. In another case, after the senior management program, an alumna resigned from a work environment where she was experiencing a lot of pressure to act unethically. She moved to work with a competitor in the same industry. It's not that the new environment was perfect, but she was able to lay down ground rules while she was being recruited and begin to initiate changes. She became known as Madam Ethics in her new workplace. In another classroom, we had a discussion on, 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 on equitable pay, about fairness to domestic, domestic staff and fair contracts with them, giving them a, a normal work schedule, making sure they have leave agreements, etc. After the class, one of the participants decided to double his driver's salary to the man's utter surprise and great joy. In another class, one of the students realized that his HR team was conflicted in a recruitment process, and he learned enough to enable him to withstand family pressure to employ his own nephew in his business. He took some tough uh, decisions, but he chose to steer his nephew towards a job elsewhere so as to avoid future conflicts of interest for himself and for his staff. Finally, we had the example of a student who, after attending the business ethics sessions, went back to change what his company was doing with regard to their customers. They used to cheat their customers, but they decided to not only send a message to all the customers saying what they had been doing and apologizing, but also to offer some um, makeup products to the customers to make up for what they had done in the past. And they were shocked at the response they got. The customers were happy, they praised them. Some of them offered to come and give them free training to improve the quality of their products and to reduce wastage. So through ethics ed education and through embedding ethics in our classrooms, my colleagues and I at the university are truly contributing to building the ethical identity of good apples and barrels. Workplaces are becoming more genuine spaces for flourishing because of our work. About my upcoming research directions, I'm currently working on understanding corruption from the unique le lens of the South African experience of state capture, and I'm exploring the use of metaphors to suggest possible ways to reduce it. With colleagues from IOH, I'm researching the effectiveness of anti-corruption training, the contextual factors that can mediate anti-corruption training effectiveness, the emotional drivers of corruption, and the subsequent need to include an emotions component in anti-corruption training, and the impact of family upbringing on anti-corruption behavior. I'm also in the middle of editing a book on humanistic management in the gig economy and co-editing books on cooperative economics, on management education, and the sustainable development goals, and on humanistic management in the public sector. Also in progress is a co-authored paper on love in organizations. Looking to the future, I intend to continue research deepening my understanding of the influences of individual ethical and unethical behavior, particularly along the line of mindfulness of one's spiritual nature as a key to responsible behavior, and to acting with integrity, and the importance of ethical striving at both individual and organizational levels. I also expect to continue researching what contextual factors in organizations and in Nigeria contribute to reinforcing in the individual ethical, individual inclination to do good and which inhibits it. I will continue emphasizing the interaction between both in my teaching as well, in order to better prepare learners to live according to the values they profess, despite the difficulties they experience from within themselves and from the environment. Together with this, I plan to research what I currently call identity ethics, hypothesizing how a disconnect in community results in fragmented identity. I attempted to depict this in the next figure you'll see on the slide. This figure shows the concentric circles of community in which we all subsist. In the closest, in the smallest circle, we have the family, and this is where loyalty and commitment are strongest. This is also where the identity of the person is strongest. The identity of the community 
the, of the person is strongest and therefore the, where the ethical identity is strongest. As we move further and further away from the family, we find the ethnic affiliation, the village in quotes. At the level of the village, we still have a strong loyalty and commitment. So long as that sense of community survives the distances across time and space, and we still have, therefore, the ethical identity being quite strong. However, as we continue moving, workplaces may have loyalty and commitment and ethical identity, but it will depend on how, to what extent the sense of identity and community is, is created within that workplace. The greatest danger is at the level of state and country. The, le the level of loyalty and commitment drops quite a bit because the identification with the community has dropped uh, a lot. And therefore, the sense of the need to be ethical within those communities is very low. People still identify more with their ethnic groups and tribal affiliations and tend to othering other people. As we migrate further and further away from our indigenous groups across and the community ties grow more tenuous. Rather than replace those ties with new ones, we tend to maintain ties only with our immediate families, whether they are close to us or far away. And the experience in the country indicates that this affects the breadth and the depth of the person's moral compass. So it seems that once an African loses the clarity of community orientation, which used to be the grounding for ethical behavior, then the tie to in the indigenous values that we had is lost in practice. The person is somewhat adrift. They don't have the grounding to automatically adopt the values from their replacement culture as their personal values in a lasting and transcendent way. So we then copy, we just copy what goes on in the environment, but we don't have values that mark us the way it would have. Other fallouts include that we don't truly experience what it means to, be got, to belong to the bigger community and therefore we don't react to the injustices that don't touch us directly. This may explain why many people choose to serve their personal or ethnic interests rather than a national one and why many people do not commit time and other resources that they might have brought to their community in a typical African village to improving public goods nationally or to participating in the affairs of the country. Part of the identity solution could mean going back to adopt the Aristotelian approach by fostering a personal commitment to human flourishing for self and then for others. However, since Africans traditionally do not flourish independently of our community or environment, we always need a complementary striving of the barrel in order to consolidate our identity as well as our ethical identity. This is where a recommitment to a common Nigerian dream and to the values that underpin it will be ideal. However, it's not clear how to get there. The national anthem and the pledge embody this aptly, but for the majority of Nigerians, we need to find out what we need to do to move from the rhetoric to reality. The general objective of my identity ethics research would be to deepen understanding of how to nurture the virtuous person in the midst of constantly changing context and current global realities which include the rapid advance, advancement of technology and the growth of virtual space of human interaction. I've spoken a lot about apples, barrels, flourishing, identity, and striving. By now, you are tired of hearing these words. But I now want to appeal to each one of us to reflect and recalibrate ourselves. We need to forge or reinforce our ethical identity independently of, of the communities we currently acknowledge. And then we need to strive to work for the common good across all those communities. In addition, those of us who work within companies whether at the lead or from the followership, we need to reflect and recalibrate the companies that we belong to, including the ones that we run within the four walls of our homes. Are your people flourishing? The nannies, the drivers, the bosses, the supervisors, the new hires, the security staff, the managers, the suppliers, the customers, 
People should not walk for or with you or around you and come away damaged or stunted physically, psychologically, mentally, or spiritually, morally. Do you create workspaces that strive to help people flourish physically, for example, health and safety, psychologically, psychological safety, mentally, for example, allowing them their voice, their creativity, or spiritually, respect for their dignity and freedom, and allowing them and enabling them to act ethically. If you strive to do this, then you are definitely becoming a more humanistic leader and or manager. I also want to remind us to build our identity, thinking of the future and of the impact on others now and in the future within the communities we belong to, family, local government, ethnic affiliation, state, country, society, and then strive and work for the common good, including building that community that constitutes an oasis of sanity with which people around you can identify and where they can flourish. And please share your stories with us, your questions, your pains, and your beautiful stories. Distinguished Vice Chancellor, honorable ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. I thank God. I thank my parents, Chief Toye and Professor Shola Ogunyemi, my siblings, Larry, Ayo, Jide, Ronke, Molly, Sheyi, Funke, Claudia, Ehiz, and Laura, my friends and other family members, impossible to list, and all my colleagues from January 2006 till date. It has been a journey. I thank my mentors, Lola Lopez Chico, Bisifa Lodo, Juan Manuel Elegido, Dominic Mele, Alejo Sison, Tola Olabi. I thank my coaches, Enase Okonedo, Inka David West, Solomon Abioroko, Oliver Lash, Stella Ankomo, Kristen Hauser. I thank my collaborators, Omar Omiogunyemi, Adora Onaga, Java Anozie, Ebele Okoye, Ernst von Kimakovic, Michael Preston, Ogechi Obiora, Belinda Nwosu, Vanessa Bogal, Neka Ode, Yetunde Anibaba, Oreva Atanya, Ngozi Okwara, etc. I thank all my students, past and present. I thank Molly, Shegun Babalola, and Cheye Ene for proofreading this lecture. Ochoa Idatsaba for the apple and barrel pictures. Sheyi for the Shakara presentation slide. And all the other people who generously worked towards making this event happen. The registrar and his team, my mom, Jide Ronke, Chiwe Mama, Lilian Chuku Jekwe, AGF Young, Chineze Ajwa, Fona Omobode and Tosin Onoyemi, Uche Asomba, Nezi Inventor, my circle group, and many more. I thank everyone here in attendance, physically, or via Zoom or YouTube. It is the ethos of Lagos Business School expressed in its mission and vision and its culture that has empowered me to achieve what I have, and I greatly appreciate this. Looking back at my own learning experience at university, I value the supportive learning environment that Pan Atlantic University provides for both faculty and students. And I believe that this is one of the assets that will continue to help us effectively achieve growth in learning and character for our graduates and build our nation. Thank you, everyone. We can do better. You will all agree with me that it has been indeed a very rich lecture. Thank you, Professor Ogunyemi. <laughs> On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Enasa Okonedo, I want to thank you all for gracing this 16th inaugural lecture of Pan Atlantic University. 
want to thank immensely members of the Board of Trustees, Pan-Atlantic University here present. We thank the members of the Pan-Atlantic University Governing Council for taking time out of their busy schedules to honor Professor Ogunyemi. We thank the immediate past Vice Chancellor, Professor Juan Elegdo, <laughs> for his presence. It's indeed a privilege. We thank the family of Professor Ogunyemi for raising such an energetic, industrious, and talented teacher. Our special thanks go to the staff and student volunteers who have planned and executed this occasion. Just a brief announcement before we leave. The procession will leave the auditorium in the reverse order led by the Vice Chancellor. All are to remain standing until the academic procession exits. We have cocktails served as usual in the foyer. All members of faculty are to remove their robes. Only the prof, our new prof, will be required to keep her robe on during the cocktail. Once again, thank you for coming. May God grant you journey mercies to your various destinations. May we rise for the university and national anthem.
Thank you. 